Hello students, today I want to go over a little bit about how to approach your argument essay and one of the key things that you need to decide is what to argue and whom you should argue it to. Um, and these questions about audience and purpose, they're really applicable to any kind of writing you do, right? Is that sometimes you know your audience really super well and that can help you gauge what to put in and leave out of your argument and how best to approach it. Um, and sometimes you don't know your audience very well. For instance, if you're sending a cover letter to a prospective employer, you may not know who that person on the other end is who's going to receive your cover letter and resume. So you're trying to guess at what they might be looking for. Um, when you know, it is much easier. So knowing your audience makes things a little bit simpler, but sometimes we just don't have that luxury. So I'm going to talk about both here uh, in this PowerPoint. So the first thing is figuring out what you believe. As you've been researching, you've probably found that you've, you're nodding your head along or agreeing with certain people, disagreeing with others. Or maybe you have a mix where you feel like, you know, you see a little bit of both sides and you agree with different reasons depending on um, who's writing. And so you really need to figure out what your stance is going to be on your research question before you can argue it. And sometimes this is easier than others. Sometimes people are very empathic and they can see both sides really well and they have a hard time making up your mind. And in that case, we might have to fake it till we make it. We might have to choose a stance and go with it. Um, but I would also say don't think that there's anything wrong with you if you are in that position because that probably means that you really do see both sides well and you've done a good job researching and you're probably a pretty compassionate person so you can you know see both sides it just might be hard to choose um, but you all you can figure out what your stance is by going with your research question and thinking what your answer to that research question is or alternatively you don't always have to argue just what your answer to your research question would be. There could be something else that you think has become more provocative than the original research question you started with. So for example here, I have the question, should the death penalty be banned? And I chose this because most people are familiar with this. So Florida still uses the death penalty at the time I'm making this video. Maybe that will change in the upcoming years, I don't know. So you may say yes, you might say no, you may have a more nuanced position where you say in some circumstances um, or you think you know yes they should but only when juries are unanimous in their votes I don't you know I don't think the death penalty should be applied if everyone does not agree in the jury it, um, so that could be something that you include in your thesis or your argument um, you can also find yourself really wanting to go a little bit more specific in the argument or you could find that yes this is the research question you started off with but what's most compelling to you now is the idea of um, juvenile justice is how old someone has to be to receive the death penalty and so that's what you want to go with or whether or not the way that we kill people is humane maybe not just you know whether or not there should be a death penalty but maybe you believe that there should be but you just don't believe that the way it's being done currently is humane so if you find one of those angles to be the most compelling angle for you then that can be the place at which you enter the conversation and that often um, you know kind of shifts your research and your organization a little bit so these are just some different ways. Your your answer to your research question or the place at where you s take a stance in your argument, that overarching claim you're going to make, that is going to become your rough draft thesis for your argument essay. And so some parameters or some characteristics of a strong thesis statement are that um, it takes a stance, right? So it's an opinion. A stance just means it's an opinion, it's an argument, because we don't want our thesis to be a question. We don't want our thesis to be a fact. Um, so it's, if your research question is something like, you know, should smoking be banned from all public places? Well, 
then you don't want your thesis to be should smoking be banned from all public places because that's a question not a stance and you similarly do not want it to be you know smoking has been known to cause emphysema and cancer that is a fact that's not a stance so make sure that your thesis statement is opinionated so my research question might say is the black lives matter movement effective simple rough draft thesis the black lives matter movement is effective now we're taking a stance here which is good but we hope our thesis can do a little bit more for our essay than just state our argument we're hoping it might also contain some of the reasoning that we're going to get into and we want to try to stay away from that fcap model where we list all the well we're typically if you're writing the five paragraph model it would be you know your claim plus a, B, and C. So the Black Lives Matter movement is effective because A, B, and C. You know, that might be the structure that you're used to, and I don't want to say that is awful or throw it out, but it's pretty unsophisticated and mechanical, and we want to try to break out of that mold. I think it is useful, it is very clear, and it does help us organize our thoughts, but generally, especially as you get to longer and longer essays in your college uh, writing career, you're not going to be able to contain your support in three tidy reasons. And so you might have to try to look for more umbrella terms or, or ways to fit your reasoning into your thesis without going into that listing model. So try, though, to get into the why or how. Um, that is going to be reflected in your essay and you're just guessing at this now you're looking back over your research and trying to say well what are the why and how of what I believe so the Black Lives Matter movement is effective because it brings attention to issues in our society where black lives are undervalued such as in the criminal justice and education systems so that might be what I'm going to go into and I've I'm specific here, right? But I'm I'm also broad enough that when I talk about things like black lives being undervalued, I can talk about what that means for a section of my paper, like in general what it means for a life to be undervalued compared to someone else's life. And then I could even go into specifically the criminal justice system. Where in the criminal justice system is it structured so that, you know, um so that black lives are not valued as much as white lives or other lives and similarly in the education system I could talk about you know the preschool to prison pipeline and things like that in there it's not just going to be one paragraph probably they can be qualified statements you know where you kind of give a nuance position you talk a little bit more about the opposing view as well as your view so I said a thesis like this might look like although black lives matter has not always focused on the right issues it is effective because it brings attention to issues in our society where black lives are undervalued such as in the criminal justice and education systems so what I'm doing when I say black lives matter has not always focused on the right issues one of the accusations that people lodge against this group um, or this organization is just that they have sometimes used violent means to get their point across or they have targeted police unfairly or they have just um, not protested ethically I guess is, is the way to put it um, and so if you had that kind of stance where you were really you know you think there is an issue in society but that this organization isn't always going about it the right way then you could have a thesis like three and sometimes it could also have a solution in the thesis statement or you can have your solution later in your paper that's really up to you so when you figure out whom you want to address there's kind of a spectrum you want to think about you want to think about you know people who um, agree with you but are unmotivated and make sure if you're thinking of that group you do include the but are unmotivated um, part of that because if you pick those people who already agree with you what's the sense in writing the paper right you're preaching to the choir there's no reason to write this paper um, but if you think about your group as maybe potentially being unmotivated 
then you can think, well, my goal is maybe to inform them a bit more. Maybe that will motivate them if they just knew this piece of evidence or if they just heard me talk about these personal stories of people on the front lines of this issue, then they would care enough to be motivated. So um, my classic example of this is um, the legalization of marijuana, right? So this was on the ballot this last time and I thought, you know, I was going out to vote on other issues, so I, I was going to vote on the legalization of marijuana, but I didn't really care about it as an issue. Was I for, you know, for all transparency, I was for um, legalizing medical marijuana, but I don't know that I would have gone out of my way to vote for it had I not been at the precinct voted for voting for other things that I cared more about. Um, so sometimes, you know, you might have a group that is not that connected to your topic or issue. Maybe you're writing about something, you know, about education and young children, but you're you're trying to get people who aren't parents to push a law or a policy forward. Well, you know, you might need to rally them a little bit. Other groups who you might focus on are those who are unaware or uninformed. So a lot of times, you know, in these issues, it does seem like raising awareness is half the battle. You feel like if people only knew the truth, but everyone's so busy and just people aren't concerned with this topic, it just doesn't get a lot of airtime, and so I'm going to give it airtime. I'm going to really explain to people what they need to know to move forward in this issue, and then they're going to move forward. And then you might also encounter those who somewhat disagree with you, right? They're not willing to um, die on a hill for this issue. They, 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 they disagree with you, but they're not in love with their stance. There's the possibility of their mind being changed. And this is often a good group to target, right? Because they're reasonable, they will listen to you. Um, they do disagree, so they already have their stance and you know what their values are, but... Um, you know, they're willing to be flexible. Those who extremely disagree, this is going to be a hard sell. I don't know. I mean, there are people who choose this group, and I understand why, but if you are, you know, a pro-life person who is arguing that abortion should remain legal to um, a group of conservatives who you know, believe in the sanctity of life and they are pro-life and they are embedded in that position, you're really going to have a tough time. It's not to say you shouldn't choose that group and try to address them, um, but just, you know, be aware that they are embedded and so your strategy might be a little bit different with them. How can you appeal to them? Well, with whichever group you choose, you want to focus on their values and beliefs. What might they object to in what you say, and how can you approach them in such a way where you're not combative, you're not trying to, you know, make your side win as much as thinking about them and what they believe in and trying to see things from their perspective and move things along? How can you gain their trust? What might you want to avoid? So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice here. So, I had a student arguing once about, um, I think she was arguing that gay marriage should be legal, but she chose to argue, obviously this was a long time ago, but she was arguing to a group of conservatives who do not believe that um, they believe that you know marriage should be between one man and one woman so that was her target audience but basically in the argument itself she called them narrow-minded she was like well people who believe this are you know very narrow-minded and I said well you know you're really probably going to make your audience hostile to your message if you call them narrow-minded especially in like the second paragraph like <laughs> at least wait till the end if you're gonna do that um, but no seriously I don't, I don't think you would want to do that at all or um, I had another student call basically the opposing view a bunch of idiots you know and and besides that not being college level word choice I was thinking you're really not going to get anywhere with your audience oh and the last example I have that I remember 
is I had a student who was writing about um, childhood obesity and her target audience was parents and she was saying things like if parents really cared about their kids they would set a good example and if parents really wanted to do right by their kids they would do this and I was like ah just be careful you know about the guilt trip there and and insinuating that parents don't care about their kids and things like that so it's really you know you have to be careful with audience sometimes Um, things you should assume about your audience when you're writing for an academic audience. Assume they are people with emotions, so you can use pathos in there. And uh, also assume they are actual people, not just me. And they are educated, so they have um, the same education you have. And, oh, hold on, I think my computer might be dying here. What is going on with my computer? Sorry, guys. It shows it's plugged in. I don't know why it's making noises. Okay, I'm going to plod on here and hope this continues. Um, you want to assume they're educated, that they will listen to reason, and that they are actual people. Even though I am the one who is going to be reading your essay, you want to pretend like you're writing it to a larger group, so not just, you know, me. So I want to give you some example audiences and what I'd like for you to do is just think, maybe pause the slides so between seeing the audience and hearing my explanation, I'd like for you to think about how you might appeal to this audience through logos, pathos, and ethos. So um, if we have the claim that guns should be permitted on college campuses, and the audience is college students and faculty who think guns pose a safety threat to people on college campuses, what could we do to appeal to this audience? What possible evidence could we include? And I know that you guys, you know, have not researched this, so you don't have um, a sp specific evidence to assert here. What I'd want you to be thinking about is this audience's particular worries. So they're worried that the guns pose a safety threat, that, you know, um, if we allow concealed carry, you know, for instance, um, or we allow get guns on campus, that I could have a student in my class who, you know, I give an F to them and they get angry and now they've got a gun, you know, where before they probably didn't have a gun. So if I was going to appeal to an audience who thought that, I might try to assuage their worries that this is a likely scenario, right, to talk about how um, now as things stand, you know, we, most colleges don't have metal detectors or things like that, so if somebody really wanted to bring a gun to class, they could bring one in their backpack and I would be none the wiser. But at least the possibility is there is that if guns were legal also that some someone could be intercepted with another person with a gun, right? Is that if they brought their gun out that, you know, um, other people would be able to protect themselves and others in the room. Um, whereas if there were no guns, those law-abiding citizens would not have that possibility. Um, there could also be statistics on the idea of, um, you know, places where guns are not present actually becoming targets for shooters, you know, schools and hospitals and places like that. So might go down that road. Or showing that there's no real correlation um, between places where guns are banned and safety that, you know, it doesn't really mean you're any safer in those areas. So, or where conversely, where guns are allowed, you are not less safe. And this is the claim that parents should be more involved in preventing childhood obesity and the audience would be their parents who believe you know, other factors are more at play than them, such as fast food and advertising and the appeal of sugary foods, um, or just life, you know, that there's no time for healthy foods or healthy eating all the time. So um, ways you might appeal to this audience might be things like addressing their concern for their children, talking about how childhood obesity leads to um, health issues such as type 2 diabetes and um, and other health concerns that heart you know 
higher risk of heart disease, those kind of things. Talking about even how um, children who suffer from obesity, that they have psychological issues as well, whether it's low self-esteem or uh, bullying, that they might be made victims of those. So that, you know, if parents were more involved in combating fast food and the appeal of sugary foods, that they would be trying to help save their children from these um, negative outcomes. So the last one I'm going to talk about here is the United States should accept more Syrian refugees and the audience might be conservatives who believe that allowing refugees into our country opens us up to a significant terrorist threat. So how might we appeal to this audience? Well again we've got to look at what their objections are. So their fear is that if we let um, people in from Syria or these countries that whether they're Syrian or not we may get someone who wants to do us harm in the mix that there's not a really good their fear is that there's not a very good vetting process for these refugees that oftentimes you know they're fleeing their country without paperwork or uh, acceptable documents that there's no good way for us to trace whether or not they have criminal they have a criminal background or criminal intent that uh, even if they don't have that criminal intent that we may be uh, ripe for someone who is going to be radicalized or has always already been radicalized and now we've let them into our country. So these are their fears and their objections and so we have to think about what evidence might uh, we or what reasoning might we give them to show that you know it's either worth it, maybe their risks are valid, but we could talk about how you know the plight of the people who are fleeing their their country these people have been displaced through no fault of their own because there's a civil war going on in their country and they're caught in the middle of it and they're getting bombed and their kids are dying and you know and to say you know that yes the possibility that we could let a terrorist in as we're letting refugees in you know that that's a very real possibility however you know it's worth the risk because these people are you know just not going to live under these conditions and they have nowhere else to go because so many other countries have accepted immigrants into their country these displaced people and um, and they just don't have any more room for them, but we we can absorb them into our population, so we should. Uh, we could also talk about the vetting process in detail so that people could feel more secure that the vetting process is doing a lot to keep people who would uh, potentially harm us out of our country. Um, we could talk about the actual incidents we could look at the evidence and I'm not aware of what this evidence shows but we could look at you know some of the bigger terrorist acts by immigrant refugees in the last you know five years and or the last terrorist acts and say were they done by immigrant refugees were they done by people fleeing their homeland um, is it likely that that is going to occur you know and how unlikely does it have to be for us to help other people so I'm not going to go into this last one, but it may be something for you to think up on your own, is that a claim college students should be required to perform 20 hours of community service as part of their graduation requirements and possible audience community college freshmen. And again, I'm letting you choose your audience. You are going to have to state in your argument essay on a separate sheet of paper um, or a separate you know, place is who your audience is. And, uh, and where they stand you know, toward your issue. Are they for it? Are they against it? Are they unaware? So I'm going to try and push you to be as specific as you can about what you know about your audience already and try to avoid the idea that you would target everyone because that's pretty vague and broad. All right, so um, ignore that little complete the rhetorical context post that's left over from an in-class assignment we did. So just please disregard that little line there and hopefully this will help you as you go on and organize and approach your essay.